Hi, and welcome to the first module of lecture 11. This lecture, like the previous one, covers linear algebra, as I guess this whole part does, part four of this course. Unlike the previous part that was focused more on the nuts and bolts of manipulating matrices and vectors, here we're going to split our time between two major topics. The first is going to be the, um, the use of linear algebra, some more conceptual ideas relating to linear algebra, and how they relate to statistics and formal theory in, in um, political science. And I'll get to all sorts of sciences related. This is a pretty general topic. The second major thing we're going to talk about in this lecture is how to go about solving systems of linear equations. Um, they split roughly equally in, the, in this lecture. First, to sort of give a broad overview. You might be, um, you might have come from the previous lecture, had you, you know, assuming you looked at that first, and come up, come away with the impression that linear algebra was a bunch of, you know, random rules, right? And in the calculus part of this course, we spent a bunch of time trying to convince you, hopefully successfully, that calculus was actually a coherent um, concept and not a bunch of rules on how to take derivatives and integrals. Here we start off in a different fashion. In the first lecture, it was just a series of rules for how to manipulate um, matrices and vectors and so on. And I hope most of those are reasonably um, intuitive, maybe not the multiplication at first, but the addition and so on. But still, it seems like a series of rules. It's not really fair, though, because linear algebra is a pretty broad topic um, of, of a good amount of interest for us in general that covers all sorts of linear mappings. Now, mapping, if you recall, was anything that takes some set to another set, right? So this was a mapping, which we called the function and defined a bunch of definitions for. There's functions and correspondences and so on that map things in one set to things in another set. Now, a linear mapping is a mapping that is linear, right? And when I say that, it's, I say that I mean that in the exact same fashion we discussed linearity way back when we first talked about functions. Right? It's a function that has properties of, um, so that so you can add. So if I take, right, I shouldn't use a plus b here, a plus b, little ones, it's going to be a plus b. And if I take another thing in here, it's going to be this. Right? It's a linear mapping. It obeys these two rules that specify a linear function, a linear mapping. Now, it turned out that we can represent linear mappings for finite sets of things by matrices. We discussed this a little bit in the previous mod, in the previous lecture, but let's now mess up our notation. Well, I'll just choose a different notation here. Um, let's say x is a matrix of some form or other, and let's say y is a vector. We call all the notation from, pre from the previous lecture. A capital letter will be a matrix, and a letter with a arrow over is a vector. Okay. Well, what this is saying is let's take some matrix, assuming y is a column vector, let's multiply by y, and that's going to produce, assuming that the matrix um, has the correct uh, the dimensions, right? So let's say this is a this is an um, n by m, and this is an n. And this will produce an n-dimensional. Uh, column vector. What it, this is saying is take the vector y and operate it, operate on it linearly using the matrix x and produce a new vector vector which might be b. Right? That's what this equation is saying. Here x, the matrix x, forms a linear operator. It takes the y's, the elements of y, and it either adds them together, maybe the, it multiplies them by some numbers in the x, and then adds them together to form the rows. Why does it do this? We can get an idea of this, um, and we'll talk about this more in a later module, but you can get an idea of this by just doing a simple example. Let's say 2, 1, 3, 6. There's a matrix. Let's say you have uh, 1, 2. What is saying? We can multiply this together. Remember, you take this, dot it with the other one, and I'm never sure if I'm going in the right direction here, but um, you take 2, 1, dot it with 1, 2, that's 2 times 1 plus 1 times 2 is 4, and then you take 3, 6, and dot it with 1, 2, so that's 3 times 1 is 3, plus 6 times 2 is 12, so that's 3 plus 12 is 15, 
and this is our new one. Well, that can also represent something, right? That kind of looks like, so this should be placed at one, two with x1 and x2. Actually, should place this thing with y1 and y2. Well, then we get the, we get the um, expression 2x1 plus x2 equals y1 using the exact same um, logic as before. And 3x1 plus 6x2 equals y2. So we have actually is a system of equations. Here's equation 1 and here's equation 2. I know that these are linear equations. The things on the left side of these things are linear functions. You, they only consist of adding the x's multiplied by constants. So this is, we'll see as soon as a linear combination of the x's in the matrix x. What this does is provide you with a system of linear equations so you can represent your system of linear equations by a matrix x. So this is what just to say that you've seen this before. Linear algebra is the study of these linear mappings. And these mappings act on a typical type of thing. We see right here, this is, this is the x vector over here, or the y vector up here, or the, the x vector down here. These are vectors. Now vectors are part of vector spaces. Now a vector space has a formal definition involving, it, it's related to the definition of a field in math. Um, there's a lot of stuff you can, you can do with that. If you go on in math or take a linear algebra class in a math department, you get this formal definition. For our purposes, it's not that important. So we're going to assume that a vector space is a, is a set of vectors. So a vector space is a set of vectors. And we're not going to assume the minimal definition that just satisfies sort of scalar distribution and additivity. With, we're going to assume that it satisfies all the properties that we dealt with in the previous lecture. So it's going to be, you're going to be able to manipulate it. There's, there are dot products, there are lengths, um, and we'll talk more about that in a second. So all the same properties that we talked about in the previous lecture are going to hold for all the elements of this vector space. Um, in particular, it has a norm. This norm we discussed before. We call it this norm can be written um, as So the dot product, right, is going to give you a1 squared plus a2 squared plus a3 squared. On well, the square root is then the norm. And you can see that. Remember that the norm, the length looked like this. a1 squared plus a2 squared plus dot dot dot. Let's read dots. <laughs> to an squared. Well, this is how you define the norm over here, right? And this is also what this dot product, the square root of this dot product would look like. So we can define the norm like this. And for our purposes, this would be the length of the vector, which is also called the norm, the norm of the vector. And we discussed that a little bit in the last lecture. In general, that's what we call a vector that has length one, normalized. Um, so it's the norm of a vector. Now you might also see a different notation. This, I mentioned this before, this is the inner product. two vectors, there's an outer product, it doesn't come up as much. Um, the inner product is not always the same thing as the dot product, but for everything, you're probably going to see it's the same thing, so we're just going to use the dot product from now on. But if you see this particular notation, that refers to the inner product, which has a similar property to the um, dot product, and it is typically more, more associated with the norm. The norm definition usually is this, not the top one, but the dot product and the, norm and the inner product are the same thing for most purposes that we're going to deal with. So if that's confusing, don't worry about it. Focus on the dot product up here, which you've already done in the previous lecture. Right. Now, a vector space is going to be any collection of vectors that has a norm and satisfies all the other properties that we did in the previous lecture. So there's a zero vector like that. That's just a vector of zeros. And you can add vectors together, and you can multiply by scalars. Um, and there's a dot product, and so on. And the dot product can be commutative. So a, b, a dot b is b dot a, um, same thing. So 
all the stuff you did in the previous lecture will hold, and that's how we're going to define a vector space. And the vectors in the vector space are going to be objects of importance to us. And so, we're, so we're going to want to understand how to manipulate them, and that's going to be the focus of the next module. Next couple modules, actually. Yeah, next couple modules. Um, well, just next modules. <laughs> so before we get there, though, why do we care so much about vectors? We'll talk more about this at the end of this lecture. But for now, we can just mention a few uses, some of which we mentioned before. For one thing, the most common usage is going to be as data in your empirical work. Right? So if I have, if this is my vector y, this might be data corresponding to my dependent variable. So here's data point 1, data point 2, data point 3, and so on, up to data point n. Typically, n is used for uh, rows for data points. It could also be my dependent variables. Right? So here's a dependent variable, data. And I might put these, 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 um, these columns of data together into a matrix. We discussed that last time. There might be m rows of a matrix that will correspond to a matrix x consisting of all, we can do it this way if you want, um, all these column vectors. Maybe there's three columns, each one's a column vector. One, two, three. So we can do all the stuff and we can represent all of our data as matrices. And we saw at the end of the previous lecture that then we can use those matrices and vectors to compute the best fit line, to compute the coefficients um, in a linear regression that minimize squared error. So that's one thing. So we can do OLS using matrices. So that's one use that we see a bunch. Um, another use is in game theory, formal theory. Well, when you have some optimum behavior, right? So x star is your equilibrium behavior. Well, if you have one person, you can just treat it as a scalar. But if you have more than one person, this ends up being a vector. So there's person one's equilibrium behavior, person two's equilibrium behavior, and so on. Or and that's, a, that's if you have three people, all of whom have one action they can take. Or you could have one person. And it can be action A, and action B, and action C. So if you have three actions you can take and try to optimize all of them, you also could have a vector. So these vectors can represent actions. And that's going to be important when we're trying to understand how to solve for the optimal actions. Again, we'll see an example of that at the end of the module. But there are more stuff. There's more examples of this too, and I'm going to forget some probably. But another one is when you're dealing with um, markup trains. This comes up a bunch, both in stats and also in um, uh, some game theory stuff, and also um, and also more bounded rational, more boundedly rational models, in which you have some kind of state vector. The state vector represents the state of the world. Um, so you might consider, like, so maybe this is the first element is the economic state of the world, and the next element is the political state of the world, and so on. That's very broad, but um, these things can take different numbers. Um, or you might just have talking about the economic state of the world and there's very good up here and there's good and there's okay and there's bad and very bad and then where you put the one in terms of the state of the world there are different ways to represent state vectors we'll talk about this more in the next lecture when we do markov chains but the upshot is you can represent the states of the world as vectors and this will come up a bunch and the reason this is useful is because um is that if you multiply for instance um by some matrix A, that matrix is a transition matrix and takes you between states of the world. So again, um, and this would be, so this would be pretty clear. You just move between good and very good and so on. This would be even less clear, but you might think that the new state, the new economic state, is some function, some combination of the present economic state and the political state and so on. So there's another use of it, and there are lots of other uses. Um, these are sort of common ones you'll see very, very often in the social sciences. So that's it for this module. In the next one, we're going to go on and talk about some properties, some really important properties of vector spaces that you've seen before. Thank you very much.